So Michael and Michael, <laughs> thank you very much for being here with me today. And thank you, Zeev. It's great to be back at another Social Innovation Summit. We are here today to talk about telling a more complete American story. And to begin that, the first thing we're going to do is just run a short video. Over the course of three centuries, more than four million people were forcibly taken from their homelands across the continent of Africa to become the human fuel driving a booming economic engine in the new world. West Africa and other outlying areas uh, became a place where you can get cheap labor. And the slave trade became a boom. It became a world changer. And that went on for 300 years as Africa, the continent of Africa, became an endless supply of human cargo. After weeks or months at sea in nightmare conditions, the enslaved Africans that survived the journey arrived at quarantine sites in the New World. From there, almost half of all enslaved Africans took their first unimaginable steps of slavery across the boards of Gadsden's Wharf on the Charleston waterfront, where they were sold as property. 48.1%, 48.1% of all of the African slaves that came to the United States entered this country through Charleston. So blackness, black culture, the African experience, the African-American experience, slavery, however you want to slice it, this is ground zero. From this epicenter of history, on this hallowed ground will now stand a museum of connection, of education and remembrance of one of the most significant events of human migration the world has ever known. I am Barbados. I am Senegal. I am Togo. I am an American. So, Michael Moore, CEO of the International African American Museum, which has not been built yet, not yet, but is in process. Give us a broader sense of this museum, its purpose, and its critical role in telling that more complete history. Well, I, I think back, um, I, I read a couple of years ago that, uh, and I won't name the state, but that slavery was described as, quote unquote, when the Africans came to help out with the farming. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think everybody understands that there's really no historical integrity to that. And uh, so because we're in Charleston, because we happen to be on the spot where uh, about half of all of the Africans who came to this continent took their first steps, I think we have a unique opportunity to tell a broader uh, swath of the story. Um, this is American history. It's, it's all of our history. Um, it's, it happens to be the part of American history that is seen through the lens of the African-American experience, but, um, but we're very excited. Uh, there will be a couple of really important sort of anchors to the experience. First will be a uh, memorial to those who took their steps there. And uh, we've got some very exciting plans, international plans around that. Um, and then the actual building itself will be anchored on one side with a gallery talking about um, all the variety of cultures and languages and histories of the people who came here. The, it's, it's a misconception that the Africans who came here were monolithic. They were all sort of one people. And so we want to explore that feat. And then on the other side, we're really excited about a center for family history. So Mike and I were talking beforehand, and we probably, I think he said, you can go back four generations, I can go back about that. And that's pretty rare within the African American community. One of the greatest casualties of this period of enslavement is the fact that we pretty much lost our sense of history, not only in this country, but absolutely 
beyond wh where we came from. And so to make a long story short, we've got a center, we've got some of the best genealogists on board, and someone can walk in really not having a clue about their history and walk out knowing not just in this country to be able to trace their lineage, but also through DNA testing uh, wherever in the world that they came from. So we're very excited. It's, it's, uh, it's an exciting project that we're undertaking and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're raising the money to be able to, to finish this and to break ground and get going. Yep. <laughs> so, Michael, you're also an entrepreneur leading a new initiative in about year two, My Brother's Keeper, for um, President Obama. Talk a little bit about what that is and how you're helping boys and young men of color. Yeah, it's interesting, this conversation about the complete American story. And I think for boys and young men of color in this country, in order to uh, talk about the complete American story, they need to be a part of that story, to feel that they're a part of that story, to feel that they have an opportunity to shape that story. Uh, and in America, we have a real challenge. Uh, you know, we've got about 7 million young people in this country that are not in school and not working. The vast majority of them happen to be boys and young men of color. Um, the President's Council on Economic Advisors did a study last summer that showed if you were a baby black boy born 25 years ago, you have a one in two chance of being employed today. That's due to early death, um, incarceration, or other inequities with education and employment. And so we have so many millions of boys and young men of color with great gifts and talents and resources that are not participating. And we have to be really careful if we're going to be a country that is globally competitive for the long haul to make sure that we're benefiting from all of those young people's talents. And you have so many young people across those, this country who do not feel like they're being engaged, uh, who do not feel like they have an opportunity. Uh, when I go into communities and I meet with young people who are 13 and 14 years old who have tattoos on their face, they don't think they're going to make it to 30 to that job interview. Mm -hmm. And so we have a real problem about needing to engage them in the American story. So the president started My Brother's Keeper really after the verdict in the Trayvon Martin case, uh, where he came and he surprised the American public uh, at a press conference and he said, you know, I'm really concerned about uh, young men of color in this country. I'm concerned about the opportunity gaps and I'm concerned that they don't think that this society cares about them. And so there has to be something that we can do. And so fast forward six months later, uh, the My Brother's Keeper initiative was created in the East Room of the White House where the president signed a presidential memorandum with the full weight of law and he put three streams of work into place. There's a policy stream of effort where we have 22 cabinet members and heads of White House offices that had to give specific recommendations to the president on what we can do. And we have 80% of those recommendations that are complete or on track right now. Things like second chance Pell, so for the first time in 30 years, uh, prisons and universities can partner together so that inmates can get access to Pell Grants. Uh, we launched Beyond the Box, uh, really encouraging colleges and universities not to have kids check a box to say if they had uh, been arrested so those applications go in the trash. Um, we launched a summer opportunity project two years in a row, giving millions of dollars to help young people with first jobs. There's a place-based uh, part of the work where there are now 250 My Brother's Keeper communities in every state. And I just went to the last state, which was New Hampshire, hmm. uh, which was the last state to become a My Brother's Keeper communities, where, where the communities have committed to developing these cradle to college and career plans, putting real resources around bold goals to do something about these opportunity gaps. And finally, the private sector has stepped up in a big way. We've seen $600 million in unlined investment so far. I saw Nancy Negron here from Opportunity Finance Network. They made a billion dollar annual commitment uh, from CDFIs uh, for low interest financing into the organizations that are doing this work. So we're working very hard to make sure that boys and young men of color mm -hmm. uh, and all young people can achieve their dreams and see themselves as a part of the American story. Well, and now soon you'll have, you'll have another wonderful place to bring them. And, and last week I had the incredible honor of standing kind of behind the podium went with Michael, with Charleston's longtime, now former mayor, Joe Riley, who was our mayor for 40 years, and our CEO, Mike Giannone, as Blackwood announced a significant gift to the museum. And the contribution that we're making is actually for the Digital Media Lab. It's that idea that if you're at the museum and you want to kind of take it with you, you can still connect. Or if you can't get there, you could still connect to it as a resource for everyone kind of everywhere. And when we were there, the, the announcement was actually at Gadsden's Wharf. They've actually ex excavated and found remnants of the wharf. It's really very moving. And you talked a little bit about your own history. Would you mind sharing a little bit of that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I've had the, I've been blessed in my career. I've had lots of great jobs, but none with uh, 
sort of the skin in the game that I have uh, with this. Um, my great-great-grandfather, well, first, even before that, my great-great-great-great-grandmother, we believe, took her first steps in this continent right on Gadsden's Wharf where we'll be building the museum. And her grandson, uh, Robert Smalls, my great-great-grandfather, uh, commandeered a Confederate boat as an enslaved uh, African, took it through uh, Charleston Harbor and delivered it to the Union, uh, fought in the Civil War, was the first African American to command a U.S. military vessel, uh, ran for the legislature in South Carolina, served in both houses, created in South Carolina um, the first free mandatory statewide public school system. And so, and that was the first in the country, by the way. Um, ended up going to Congress, served across five terms, um, did a number of things there. So I've had lots of history personally in Charleston and uh, being able to work on a project that I feel so deeply, you know, sort of connected to just makes it uh, all the more special and gives me that even more, that little extra, you know, kick in the pants to, to make this thing happen, to get the money raised and to, to get it open. Yeah. So. I'd love to hear your reactions of the museum, and, and particularly, you know, next week, Charleston is marking um, a year since the Mother Emanuel tragedy, which, you know, Charleston, again, was ground zero, but it really did affect people everywhere. Um, and one of the questions that we think about is, have we done enough, have, have things changed enough since that tragedy, and, and where do we need to go? What can each one of us do? This museum has a wonderful role, and it's gonna help us um, tell a more complete story. It's gonna help us celebrate accomplishments that have been left out of history. Um, what are your reactions? You know, first on the museum, I, I'm, I'm so incredibly excited about it. I was telling Michael uh, that I had an opportunity a uh, month or so ago to visit the Civil Rights Museum down in Atlanta. Um, and it's an opportunity, no matter how many times you read it in the history book, to interact with it, to touch it, um, to, to kind of be transported back there. They have an exhibit uh, where you sit at a lunch counter and you put the headphones on and there are people yelling uh, profanities, uh, just as the, our freedom fighters went through um, at, at that time. And it is so incredibly important for our young people to know their history, uh, to know where they came from, to know the heroes uh, like your great-great-grandfather who fought on their behalf, to know that they have that same spirit inside of them to keep fighting uh, through the challenges that they'll have today. Uh, and so I'm so excited about all of the recognition um, of our history and the opportunities that our young people will have to interact with that. Um, and you know, in, in terms of the work of My Brother's Keeper and the tragedy in Charleston, I think one of the things that is so important is talking about it. Um, we have a history in organizations and in this country of wanting to sweep things under the rug. And if we are not honest about our past, if we are not honest about our biases, we will never overcome them. And that's why I'm so proud of these My Brother's Keeper communities around the country that are having the tough conversations. Uh, Mayor Marty Walsh in Boston, he said to me, Michael, you tell the president that this Irish Catholic mayor is going to talk about race yeah. and all across the country and Nashville like we're seeing that mayor. stepped up it's it's you know it's it's incredibly exciting and that's where change begins to happen I wanted to just add um, you know I grew up in Boston um, in the 70s and uh, while Boston has sort of the branding of being a very liberal progressive place and at least at that time it was kind of tough around issues of race busing was a big issue and so that I think exacerbated was tension. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but so, you know, because of my connection to Robert Smalls and someone in history that I could sort of reach back and feel good about, I think that really created something of a counterbalance against a lot of the stuff that society was throwing at me. And so, you know, I've got four young sons now and I try to fill them with as much good stuff as I can, knowing what the world will throw at them. And the world throws stuff at everybody, but in particular, I think, you know, as, as Mike said, that there are some unique challenges to, to young men of color. And so that's why, that's another reason why I think this museum is so important. They, you know, people need to know that there are people who look just like them who have achieved great things. I, I read a statistic um, that I don't know whether it's literally true or not, but I think directionally it's true. It said that 95% of all the people who young children learn about from K through 12 are white men. And if you happen to be a white male, then obviously that positions you yeah. for success. You don't yeah. think twice about what you can do and accomplish. But if you are not, if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, then it can 
call into question, you know, sort of the arc of your aspirations and, and where you might think you can go. And so I think, you know, museums like the one, the amazing one that's being built yeah. here and the one that we're building in Charleston, I think, have a really important role. Again, not just to tell sort of the broader sort of swath of American history, but, uh, but also to help people whose history has been um, muted to some degree to, to hear those stories and to feel a connection to, to some stories that they can feel good about as well. And you have a very extensive advisory board, some, you know, people, uh, some who are in the video and others who, across the country and who are helping with this effort. Where are you exactly in the project? We are in the design phase. Um, in terms of the actual building, uh, we, we've got an amazing group of partners. Uh, I am Pay's partner, Harry Cobb, is our architect. Uh, we've got Ralph Applebaum and Associates, the preeminent museum designer, um, working with us. We've got a wonderful group, and we're pulling together a very powerful and impactful uh, experience. Um, from a sort of business side, uh, total project is $75 million. We've raised about 55 of that at this point. And uh, those last dollars are the most important ones so that yeah. we can get going. And, uh, you know, we're, we're on the road and having fun. Yeah, so you can come down and help us celebrate the groundbreaking and the yeah. opening. And, <laughs> Absolutely. And bring your family from North Carolina. So any final thoughts for our, our audience here about that complete story? How long is it going to take us to catch up? I mean, we have a lot of history to cover that I know I wasn't taught. A lot of us weren't taught. That, that's probably a $64,000 question. I mean, I don't know how long it will take. I, I know that, uh, you know, the American people, there's a goodness and there's a, um, you know, an impulse to, toward sort of the right thing that, uh, that just needs to be fed. I mean, we, we're in an environment now, not to get too political, but where race and nationality and gender are perhaps used as wedge issues and divisive kinds of things. And I think if we can sort of power through those kinds of experiences and focus on, you know, the ideals, uh, those, those American ideals that our founding fathers talked about, I think, you know, we, we've, we can do that. Yeah, wonderful. Final parting thought? You know, I would just say, while we have great challenges, we've made great progress. Um, I even look at the, this administration. Um, we now have an 82% graduation rate, um, the highest in decades. Uh, and we're seeing graduation rates going up for black and Hispanic uh, populations. Um, we, you know, we talk about the, the negative images of boys and young men of color, uh, but we know that there are more uh, young men of color that are in college than are in prisons. Um, I meet scientists, I meet coders, I meet founders, and we've got a great story to tell about the amazing young people in this country who we should be lifting up and supporting. The other thing I would say is we all have a role to play. We are doing a great deal on policy, we are calling the private sector to action, but everyone has a role to play in making sure that the doors of opportunity are thrown open for the young people that come behind you. You can be a mentor, you can, have a, you can host an apprenticeship, you can open an internship uh, for, for your small business. Um, do whatever it is that you can do to make sure those that come behind you have the same opportunities that you have. Not because it's a, a moral thing to do or the right thing to do, but because it's dependent on the success of our nation's future. Yeah. Well, Michael and Michael, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you.